It is September 7th, Wednesday afternoon. We're picking up in Bereshit, Genesis. We're still very close to the beginning, especially when you consider we are, what, about 6,000 years past? <laughs> A little less. But uh, anyway, um, last time when we ended, we were talking about the curse that Ham brought on, or Ham brought on his line um, through his rebelliousness toward his father, toward the Lord. Uh, we saw that his son, Canaan, or Canaan, the curse goes through his line. It could very well be that he was already alive and part of the rebellious nature like his dad. Often we pass down to our children genetically things that we'd rather not. But we all in our humanness, our, the sin line is passed down to the children and visited on further generations. We saw that his line would be servant or subservient to his two brothers, to Yafet or Japheth, the eldest, and Shem. Shem means the name, and we know it's through Shem that the messianic line will come. And both of those lines we see um, blessed more. Ham, his line, it was the Ethiopians and the Libyans and the Egyptians and the Africans that came through his line. We know that, that many times in history they have been in slavery, they've been beat down. So we see it. We also saw very quickly, or we will, those of us who took a sneak peek ahead, saw that Nimrod comes from Ham um, through Cush, the son. So Nimrod's not his immediate son, but um, if I remember right, his grandson. Anyway, we'll get to that in Genesis chapter 10, starting with verse 6. We should get to that today. But overall, the view that we looked at was that he founded the city and the empire of Babylon. Mizraim was another son of Ham, and he was the father of the Egyptians. We've already talked about how the Egyptians have been uh, at times in slavery that we see as part of what was promised to that line. I don't think I looked up last time uh, Psalm 78 and verse 51. Uh, but I'll read that to you in just a moment. Psalm 78, that's Tehillim in Hebrew. Psalm 78 and verse 1. Let's try verse 51. I don't know how I got one out of that, but I knew it wasn't at the start. Verse 51 says, And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the first issue of the virility in the tents of Ham. When it says in the tents of Ham, that means that they were the, the descendants of Ham. And we know that the firstborn death came to Egypt at the time of Passover, Pesach. That you know the story well. When Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelis go, the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. So we see here um, Egypt under the subjection of the hand of God in a heavy way because of judgment they brought on themselves. Um, Egypt and Babylon both um, were reduced to subjection, first by the Persians that were descended from Shem, later by the Greeks and the Romans who came from Japheth. So both lines have had their, their chance to, I'll put it this way, lord it over the others. Um, and they never recovered totally from those early subjections. They never came back up into the power they were. Alexander the Great comes from Japheth line, and he defeated the Phoenicians in 331 BC. The Battle of Carthage, 146 BC, very famous, is when the Phoenicians, who were Canaanites, were defeated again. And the whole of Africa, as I said, is descended from Ham for many centuries. The greater part of Africa has been under the dominion of first the Romans, then the Saracens, which that was any Arab tribe living in the Sinai Peninsula during the first three centuries AD, and finally even from the Turks, and the Turks came from the line of Yafet or Japheth again. So if I'm saying this a little fast, we're going to pick it up in some degree um, in chapter 10, because we're going to be looking at all the nations, but uh, if, if you need me to slow down, let me know, otherwise I'll keep moving, because we have a lot of history like that to cover today. When we looked at verse 26 back in Genesis 9, in Bereshit chapter 9 and verse 26, we saw also that the blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, let Canaan be his servant. Blessed be the Lord, we saw that's Jehovah, the God of Shem, was indicating that Shem is that godly line. The same way that we saw Seth was the godly line, Kion, Cain was not the godly line. So we're seeing the indication right from the beginning here again with 
the beginning of humanity again, so to speak, that Shem is your godly line. Does that mean that everybody from Shem is godly? No, that's not what we're saying, but it's the line that God is working through, and it's the line that Messiah will come through. We see that Israel is from Shem. That's Shmot, Exodus chapter 29 and verse 45. And I will read that for you in just a moment. Shmot or Exodus chapter 29 and verse 45. Where we read. Okay, what did I do wrong? I don't have a 45. Now it's popping up. My tablet's <laughs> having a problem today. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God. Okay, that's. 29.45 of um, Exodus and what we have when we follow it in the history there this is the line that God is saying the, that this is my line um, how did I just read that my brain I'm sorry I will dwell among the sons of Israel and be their God this he was talking to those who were of the line of Shem what becomes Israel at that time who does God call his people the children of Israel that's what I'm trying to say I'm saying it may be poorly but you get the idea. What, what we're hearing in that is the covenant relationship. God made covenant with Avraham. We're going to come to that fairly soon. We'll get to Avraham. Then we're going to see that Avraham is a descendant of Shem. And we know it goes on down from Avraham to Yitzhak, Isaac, Yaakov, Jacob, and so forth. So that's the line of Shem. Um, the Hebrews, when they're known as the Hebrews, are from the line of Shem. Uh, there are other Semitic races that are also from that line. We'll look at that again in better detail in chapter 10. But take a sneak peek with me right now in Genesis chapter 10 and go to verse 21 because I like to make sure, you know, hearing it once, twice, three times helps me remember and understand. In chapter 21, we have that children were also born to Shem, or Shem, the father of the children of, and the word in your English looks like Eber, E-B-E-R. It is believed that that's a derivative of the word Hebrew. Now, we'll learn Hebrew means crossed over. We'll see what that means in its totality, but in case if you aren't for that class, you know, for some reason, I don't want to leave you just totally hanging, it, when it's referring to Abraham crossed over literally he crossed over the river and he moved to where he was leaving behind idolatry and he was coming into the land of promise where he was going to be living that faithful life and to the one true and living God it also became to mean that um, figuratively also that he crossed over not just over the river idolatry into true worship We'll see just how much idolatry was around Avram even before his time when we study what's coming up in chapter 10 and especially in chapter 11. Wow, there was so much idolatry it made my head spin that this had already developed to that point. Um, let me go back and show you also just real quickly before we move forward. Canaan being the servant, Canaan being the servant, was fulfilled even in Joshua's day. We see several times when we're going to see um, this, this prophecy being fulfilled because God said it would be through the generations. Joshua chapter 9 and verse 3, just to give you a couple of examples. When we read there, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, then they're going to act craftily because they know they're going to be swallowed up next. Well, who were the Gibeonites? The Gibeonites, when we study them from 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 21 and verse 2, we'll see it also in Genesis 10. They came from Canaan, and the Amorites also came from the line of Canaan, or Canaan. Uh, the, the Canaanites were put into forced labor in the book of Judges, we see that. So we move from Joshua just next door to the book of Judges. We want to go to Judges chapter 1 and verse 28. And we read there. Well, we will in a moment. <laughs> Judges chapter 1 and verse 28, where we read, It came about when Israel became strong 
that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. This is referring, remember Joshua led them into the promised land. They had to take out, or they were to take out seven enemies that were in the land. God promised them if they stayed obedient to him, he would clear out the land for them. He would rid them of their enemies. When they, he told them to attack and to not leave any alive, and they chose not to follow completely, and they left some alive, it came back to bite them. This is one of those cases. They didn't wipe out all the Canaanites completely, and some of their relatives down the line are going to give them grief. Let me give you an example as we keep moving on. First Kings. First Kings is right after Judges. We're going to go to First Kings chapter 9. And we'll stop at verse 20 and 21. First Kings 9, 20 and 21, where we read, As for all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, the Jebusites, who were not of the sons of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land whom the sons of Israel were unable to destroy utterly, from them Solomon, Shlomo, levied forced laborers even to this day. So when Solomon's building the temple and he's using forced labor to do it, these are the people he drew from. Notice the names, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites. They're always mentioned with the Can Canaanites or the Canaanites. The Jebusites, um, somewhat, they, they were in the area of Jerusalem. We'll get into that in chapter 10 again. And the Hivites also. My point being, they were related. They were relatives. They were cousins. And we see them go into forced labor under the sons of Israel. They were not of the sons of Israel. They were uh, those without, not in Shem's line. So with all that in mind, we see God fulfilling those prophecies of the sons, the three sons of Noah, from whom we have the um, world population come from. And we see that what God was saying was exactly what does happen. And it started immediately, and we see it continually. When we look at verse 27, and I think I'm in chapter 10, I am. Go back to chapter 9, verse 27, in our what I thought was going to be a quicker review than I've done. It says, May God enlarge Japheth, or Japheth, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. His name means enlargement. He was to enlarge. He was to, to keep um, getting more land. And his was to become the largest race. The Caucasians or the Gentiles, we'll see in Genesis 10, chap chapter 10, verses 2 and 5, come from here. And when it talks about living in the tents of Shem, um, or, yeah, dwelling in the tents of Shem, that's meant in a positive way. That's not anything negative. They were nomads in that time. They lived in tents. But the idea to live in somebody's tent like that was a, a figure of speech, meaning that there was fellowship there. There was blessing there. So they were blessed to be in the tents of Shem. They were receiving blessing from Shem's line. Uh, and they also were able to be... Uh, rulers over the other line of Ham, so that we see them both, Japheth and Shem, having servants from Canaan's line. And that's what's meant by let Canaan be his servant. Then we looked last week at how Noah lived another 350 years after the flood, but we don't read of anything during that time except for the one episode that we went into detail about last week. I think when we realize that we take one like Noah and we look at his character, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was the only one that stood faithful in a world that was not faithful. He was blessed to go into the ark because of his relationship with his God. He was not destroyed in God's judgment because he was seen as righteous before the Lord. And then we see the fall that we talked about last week. We see Shaul Paul warn us in scripture that we need to behoove ourselves and where we're at and take heed. In my mind comes pride cometh before a fall, which is very true also. As soon as you think that you're, you're all this, you're succeeding, and look at me, look out, because that's when you'll trip and fall. But 1 Corinthians 9.27 is what I cross-referenced it with for today. That says, and it's Shaul Paul talking, he says, But I discipline my body. I make it my slave. So after I've preached to others, 
I myself will not be disqualified. He realized the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. He knew he had to discipline himself and not allow himself to get caught up, to get haughty, to be full of pride, to think he didn't need God, to even just not be as dependent by spending time with God. And that's where it behooves us. When things are going well, you need to be very careful that you don't spend less time with the Lord, that you don't start to make decisions on your own or do things without putting the Lord in that driver's seat like you do when you're in desperate need and you're on your knees. We should always be in that position where we are subservient to our God and we follow what we're telling others how they should live. Well, we need to be living that way too. None of us want to find ourselves disqualified in the sense that the Lord has to say, whoops, I've got to pull you out, correct you, to be able to put you back in. We don't want to meet with his disapproval and his, uh, if I use the word rejection that way, understand I'm not saying that, you're, that you become not saved. That's an impossibility. Any more than you can become unborn. Once you're born, you are born. Once you're born again, you're born again. You can't stop that. You can't lose that. But you certainly can lose that fellowship, that closeness, that direction, that blessing. Need I say any more? We all know the flip side of that coin, do we not? And we know we don't want to get near there. But I appreciate that Scripture brings us out <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the high points. He brings out the warts on people too because it allows us to see Noah was a real person. We can't look at him and say, oh, I could never be a Noah. We can see he was just human. He was just like you and I. And that's why I think the Lord includes the faults and the, the sins of these people that are representative of a life living unto God in the scriptures for us. Just to warn us, don't think that, oh, I'm so good, I'm so close to the Lord, it never happened to me. Because that's when you hit that danger zone, because you're now thinking that you're doing it with, you know, on your own and by your own power. I also like the fact that we can see the positive, that we don't let one momentary slip define his whole life. We look at him and we talk about him far more about his walk with God, his stand before the world, than we do of his sin. And I'm thankful for that. I think I've said enough. Let me give you some extraordinary resemblances between Noah and Adam, okay, Adam. I'm going all the way back. Adam is the beginning. Noah is another beginning. And when we look at both of them, we see that both Adam and Noah were placed on the earth, which had come out of a flood because of God's judgment on it. Okay, God judged this earth. We know it was Satan's kingdom. It was judged in the chaos that we saw on the face of the earth, the description given in chapters 1 and 2. We know that it was God's judgment on this earth that, that made it the way it was, and the judgment apparently was flood covering the earth the same way that, or very similar, that in Noah's day, flood covered the earth in judgment. That, of course, was chapter 6 and following 6 to 9 are Noah's chapters. So both came out out of a time when there was a flood on the earth out of God's judgment and both are the ancestor for all men present in the world. Everybody came from Adam and then everybody comes from Noah. Okay? Of course, one of his three sons. Both were made Lord. They were made to exercise control over God's creation. In Genesis 1.28, God gave it to Adam. And in Genesis 9, verse 2, God gave that, that control, that leadership over, that lording over in chapter 9 and verse 2 for Noah. <laughs> okay, hello, Max. <laughs> he came out of the flood in his great, 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 great grand kitty, <laughs> kitties, his relatives. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, sweetie, he's used to, this is usually his little home and he's trying to stay in it and he's sliding. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. Both Noah and Adam were blessed by God and told to multiply and fill the face of the earth. Genesis 1.28 tells us about Adam and chapter 9 verse 1 tells us about Noah. Both to multiply and fill the face of the earth. Adam was placed in a garden to dress it, 
it says in, in Genesis 2.15 to um, till it, to keep it. Okay? He was to take care of the garden. Noah, we know, became a husbandman. Remember, that meant that he had planted a vineyard. So he had a garden. His garden may not have been as extensive. It certainly wasn't as lush and beautiful because God had created the, the first. But still, Noah and Adam both worked in a garden. They both had, had uh, well, Noah planted a vineyard in chapter 9 and verse 20, and Adam was placed in the garden in chapter 2 and verse 15. And in both gardens, we see fruit. But look what happens. It was with fruit that Adam transgressed and fell in chapter 3. And it's the product of that vineyard that was the occasion that brought on Noah's fall because he got drunk from what he grew in his garden. That's Genesis chapter 9. And the sins of each one, of Adam and Noah, resulted in the exposure of their nakedness. Adam suddenly knew he was naked. Noah's nakedness is seen by his son and covered by his other sons. We read both in Genesis 3, verse 7, and chapter 9, and verse 21. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, 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 I gave you the right, okay? Both of them had their nakedness covered by another. God covered Adam and uh, Shem and Japheth covered their dad. Genesis 3.21, Genesis 9.23. And the sin of both, Adam and of Noah, brought a terrible curse on their posterity. Noah, we've just been talking about the curse that came on Ham's line, chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. And it, we see it with Adam. We know it, it, the sin entered all of mankind. I'll take you all the way to Romans to read that in a nutshell, and I'll read to you Romans 5, verses 12 and 14. Romans 5, verses 12 and 14. And here is where we read, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, that's referring to Adam, and death through sin, so, if you all don't like death and the fact that you have to deal with death, here's where it came. It was a great curse from the posterity of Adam because in one man, sin entered, death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And then verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moshe, that's Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. That means even those who didn't have a rebellious nature and didn't do what Adam did in that same way, still they fell under the curse of sin. They were born with a sin nature. They had sinned in their lives. The result, the wages of sin, is death. No one has managed to live this life perfectly yet. You can't even get out of infancy living perfectly because you're born with a sin nature. That's just all there is to it. So uh, we see it started with Adam, and when he said it went from Adam to Moshe to Moses, well, Noah's in between that. So we can see it even right on through. It really goes all the way back to Adam, but we see in Noah and what happened to Ham's line, the same similarity. And again, both had three sons. Adam's third son, Seth, is the line leading to the promised seed. And Shem is listed third in the genealogy in chapter 10, especially verse 21. We'll see when we get there. His line leads to the promised seed. Japheth is, is mentioned in 10, chapter 10, verse 2, and Ham in chapter 10, verse 6. And then Shem isn't until we get down further and especially verse 21. So he's the third listed, whether he was the third born or not in that order. We'll talk about that as we get into that. We've already dealt a little bit with that too. And our last point of similarity between the two is that almost immediately after Adam's fall, a wonderful prophecy was given that contained for the outline of history, redemption. That God planned redemption for all of mankind. What I'm referring to is the very familiar I hope to you a verse of Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the Messiah, the seed of the woman that would curse this, the, well, crush the head of Satan, that would bring Satan and his power to an ultimate end. We see that right after Adam's sin, God brings that, that promise of hope 
that yes, the whole world now is going to suffer sin, its consequences, death, but the whole world can be redeemed in the Messiah. Almost immediately right after we read of Noah's fall, there's a remarkable prophecy that's uttered containing in outline the history of all the major races of the earth that God is saying in essence with Noah, with his um, sin here, the whole world is not going to be cursed and damned and no one can be saved. We've got a line that's going to continue on that is godly. We're going to see that that line that's going to bring the Messiah was for all the nations. Not just for Shem, not just for Shem's line, but through that line, through that one, through that seed, through Messiah, the, all the nations of the world could receive redemption and be blessed. We'll see all the major races of the earth. Starting with Genesis 9, we looked at 25 to 27, the three sons, but we'll get this extensively and amazingly in chapter 10. You'll see why I said amazingly very shortly. So 10 points I just gave you are the comparison between Noah and Adam. I think it's very interesting. Both starters, progenitors of the race, very similar. I get the idea, man is man is man is man. <laughs> and God is God, and he redeems. Hallelujah. So, Noah's age, as we're going back and getting ready to go into chapter 10, Noah's age, we saw 600 at the time of the flood, 350 years later. So we see from verse 28, basically, when we put it together, 29 spells it out. All the days of Noah were 950 years. Now, it specifically tells us in verse 28 that he lived 350 of those years after the flood. When we get to Avram, who is going to be huge on our um, study, you know, he's the father of faith, he's been called friend of God. We're going to see a, a, a great example in Avram. I'm, I'm fighting for my words, but he's huge, okay? He was born 352 years after the flood. Did you catch that? Noah lives 350 years after the flood. Abram's born 352 years after the flood. So Noah dies just two years before Abram is born. Now, if you're like me, you've taken Noah and you've got him over here. You've got Adam here, you've got Noah here, you've got Abraham down here. And you don't see how close these lines were, how much overlapping. They almost overlapped. Surely Abram would be able to know Shem, Noah's son, because he lived after his father died. There are some that try to do a timeline that will tell you that Abraham was 58 when Noah died. If so, then they could have even known each other, but that source is not as well received, I'll put it that way, as the many sources that say that Abram was born two years after Noah died. But I, I find it very interesting to realize how these people lived at the same time or near each other, and again, the overlapping. We're going to see that when we talk about Job very shortly, because you'll hear that Job lived at the time of the patriarchs. Well, Abraham is one of the patriarchs, so you're putting Job now near Abraham's time. And you can, I can hear people saying, but wait a minute, I find Job halfway through my Old Testament. Right, it's not chronological. You have to, if you want to see the chronology of the Bible, get a Bible that is chronological. And you will see that as soon as, right shortly after you've read about creation, you're reading about Job. Okay, just an eye opener for those who haven't seen it before. But again, as we leave behind Noah, I hope that he is a real person to you. I hope that you don't just dwell on his sin that was given, that you see he was a man that had great triumph, and yes, he had a moment of weakness. But even God chose to remember him in his godliness rather than in his fault. Why do I say that? Because when God brings his name up again, we're going all the way to Hebrews chapter 11, which is known as the Hall of... You're all muted, aren't you? Hall of Faith. Good, I can see the mouths going that we're saying it, yes. Hall of Faith. This is God's chapter of faith, those who lived by faith. 
He uses them as an example, and he only gets to verse 7 in that chapter when it is said, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, had never seen rain, in reverence, that means he respected, revered, and was obedient to his God, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, by preaching to them and them not receiving, he brought condemnation to them, and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So, does Noah enter into a righteous reward? Absolutely. Because that's what it just said there in the end of the verse. He became an heir of the righteousness according to faith. When we have faith in our God, we receive the righteous reward of life with Him eternally. And that's where God chooses to remind us about Noah, that he was a man of faith, that he lived a life that exemplified faith to an unsaved world, and God brought him into a righteous standing through the blood, shed blood of Yeshua Jesus according to his faith. Second Peter, second Kepha, the last mention of Noah in our Bible. I don't know how many of you realized he was mentioned in the very beginning and almost in the very end. Second Peter chapter two, and this is what we read of Noah there. Second Kepha, second Peter chapter two and verse five, and did not spare the ancient world. God is saying, for God didn't spare the angels in verse 4. He didn't spare the ancient world in verse 5, but preserved Noah. Here's the description. A preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he's called a man of faith in Hebrews, and he's called a preacher of righteousness in Second Peter. I'm thankful for that, that he's, his exemplary life was not so marred by a situation, a circumstance that it caused it all to be of, of no value. No. God works with us. When we make mistakes, he still has use for us. He doesn't say, now it's over, you blew it, I've got no use of you. No. No. But, but don't stay in your need for correction. Move back into where God can say, when I, he looks at you, there is one who is living an exemplary life, a life of faith, a life of righteousness. How do we do that? Do we muster it up ourselves? No. No. We know that it's only the power of God in us. And we have to yield our will and our heart and our way to allow the power of God in us to take control and to help us live that life that we want to live that's pleasing to the Lord. I uh, respect Noah. I look forward to meeting him, hopefully sooner rather than later. And... Uh, Ask him a few questions about that first rainbow he saw. Well, Think right. it, the first rainbow he saw, <laughs> among other things. Okay. I got some arc questions too, <laughs> uh, which probably won't matter in the least then, but curiosity wants to know. <laughs> wants to know, wants to see all the animals he got to see, et cetera, et cetera. But because I promised you chapter 10, especially if you got my reminder for today, let's get into chapter 10. And we're going to be introduced to what is called the table of the nations. In other words, this is the origins of the nations of the world. There's a man by the name of Dr. William F. Albright. He is universally acknowledged as the world's leading authority on archaeology of the Near East. Now, he himself was not a believer in the infallibility of scripture. So he's one that's not going to say, okay, it's, it's got to be exactly how Scripture said. He's using Scripture for his study, but he's, he's not coming at it from the same way you and I will. And still he said about chapter 10, and I quote him, it stands absolutely alone, this table of nations, okay? It stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel. The table of nations in Genesis 10 remains an astonishingly accurate document. So even though he comes at a different angle to the word of God, he was saying, wow, this is so accurate. This is so specific. This detail is astonishingly amazing, and it is so accurate. It, it's almost like it was a mind blower to him. I hope he came to faith in God. I don't know if he did or not. 
but there is nothing else in all ancient writing that's been discovered by archaeologists that is comparable in the scope and the accuracy that we have here for us in chapter 10. It gives the appearance of being a sort of family record. It was probably kept by the patriarch of the family, and that we'll see was Shem, Shem being one of Noah's sons, would be most interested in God's promise of the coming seed because he was the, the spiritual son out of them, like Seth was the godly, Shem. So knowing that Noah knew and would be teaching his sons, it was Shem who picked it up and said, I, I value that. I want to know about the coming Messiah. He'd be interested in the line and genealogy that would lead to the Messiah, and he would be leaving these records. He lived 502 years after the flood. Um, and that would encompass the whole time that we're going to see, even through Genesis 11, verses 10 and 11. Um, in fact, let me read that for you. I think that says it better than if I try to sum it up. Chapter 11, verses 10 and 11 says, Here is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he fathered Arpachshad. Who knows if I'm saying it right? Two years after the flood. So, okay, Shem's 100 when he gives birth to his son two years after the flood. Remember we talked about the fact that Shem was 98 during the flood. After, I'm going to call him Arpak, <laughs> after he was born, Shem lived another 500 years and had sons and daughters. So Shem's going to live to 600 years of age, actually 602 if we want to be real accurate, and he's going to have other children. Uh, besides the ones that are going to be given to us in this line. But if we're told all the way here about this with Shem, the way that it's written is very likely that what we're reading is what Shem kept the records of and passed down. So you may have a genealogist in your family. You may have one that has studied your family tree and passed down to you. Maybe they it was your grandparent. Or maybe you're doing it and giving it to a grandchild. In that same way, Shem, it seems, was the one who took particular interest in keeping these records and being able to pass them down. However, whatever, whatever reason, let me just say God had his hand in it because God was proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that Messiah would belong to this line, that it would be proof that he was Messiah. If it could have been shown that he wasn't in this line, then he would have been disqualified. So it was part of what God was doing for his ultimate purposes, but it also gives us the history of mankind, and it does it so accurately that, in my mind, it should be speaking to every mouth out there that wants to deny the infallibility about Scripture. Well, then how was this pulled off? How did we get such an accurate record if it wasn't the infallible word of God. No matter how you come at scripture, it proves itself. Whether you come at it with the archaeologist's shovel, I love the expression, turn a spade, turn a page, meaning in your Bible. Give archaeology enough time, they prove the Bible. We find all kinds of proofs of things that, that human sources of history want to deny. One fast, quick example close enough in our time for us to understand. Pontius Pilate played a, a major role in the crucifixion of Yeshua Jesus. We know that, we've read that in the Gospels. For a long time, the mouths of the unbelievers said, there could not be anyone like Pontius Pilate in history for real. If there was, there would be proof of him outside of the Bible. Because he's not mentioned anywhere else except in the Bible, there's no way he was a real person. It was either 1955 or 1959, I forget which, but in the 50s, as they were digging excavations in the area of Caesarea, which is the area where there was um, Roman control, where authorities would sit and judgments were given, in that area, as they were uncovering the excavations that you can go see on a tour to Israel today, what do they uncover but a very large stone that had chiseled into it. The writing that was chiseled into it talked about Tiberius the Caesar, who we know as a fact was Caesar who um, Pontius Pilate was under. 
right after that top part of the rock talks about Tiberius, it mentioned Pontius Pilate. Here in stone, outside of scripture, was living proof that Pontius Pilate lived and ruled in the position that scripture told us he had done. Wasn't there a rock or something that has... It's a, it's a rock. It's a, it's a big... I've seen it. It's big. And I, I, you can see it etched. And as long as you can read the language, you can read you know the names but it's clear enough nobody questions it everybody had to accept it time and again we've got coins that have been found recently proving david's connection to the area called the temple in jerusalem we find all kinds of archaeological proof go ahead oh you got like one bar here i'm green Okay, if I go down or if you see Roger fooling, we're changing batteries because he says I'm going to run out of power. And I'm not out of class time, so I want to keep talking. <laughs> Archaeology is just one way that we see it in Scripture. Or see the proof of Scripture, I'm sorry. We see it now as we're saying historically. That's the records are so accurate. There is a chapter in Daniel on what the war would be like in such living detail that it was said, oh, Daniel couldn't have told that prophetically. It had to been written after. It had to been history being recorded because it's just too accurate. Then they found the manuscripts that they knew dated, I think it's 200 years before the time of that war, that was living proof. Here's a description of it. They authenticated the time of those manuscripts predating that war that Daniel gave exactly. How did Daniel give it in such detail? Because the Holy Spirit dictated every word of scripture. The Holy Spirit knows what's going to happen in the future as well as what's happened in the past. The Holy Spirit revealed to man what to write. They didn't write of their own. They didn't write their own opinions. If they wrote their own stories, do you really think Noah would have included his boo-boo? <laughs> I think any of us would want to gloss over our mistakes and not hang it out for the world to read. But we see every way uh, the Bible can be proven. Every way. Anyone can come at it, a mathematician. Anyone can come at it in any angle, including the scientists. And if they are fair with what really is told in Scripture and what they really see in their, I'm going to say, test tubes, it never goes against the Word of God. It proves the Word of God again and again and again. And there are those who are the brainiacs, who are the scientists, who have written many books that say science cannot lie. It proves the Bible. So those who use the excuse that say scientifically that science and the Bible can't walk hand in hand can be proven absolutely wrong. Those who say, oh, well, there's many discrepancies in Scripture, ask them to show you. And I guarantee you, God will give you the wisdom to give the answer to show it is no discrepancy. Here in chapter 10, the historicity of man, of the nations of man, so amazing that one who didn't believe the Bible to be the authoritative word of God, so nobody can say, oh, well, he had a preconceived conclusion. He wanted it to be that way. No, he came at it just looking at it like it's a history book just like all the others. But he said, wow. Nothing is so astonishing. Nothing reaches this level. And we've got it right here given to us in chapter 10. So we are going to take a look at chapter 10 in detail and see what we are told about the nations of the world. We're going to see in chapter 10 that the sons of Ham and Japheth are given only to the third or fourth generation after the flood, you know, their, their beginnings. Shem's goes down to the fifth or sixth generation. And that, again, would indicate Shem's being the author. What we're going to see is that he probably lost track of the other lines, but God kept the line that's going to go to Messiah being recorded and continuing down. From that subscript that I read to you in Genesis 11.10, again, it seems that Shem wrote the genealogy, and the Hebrew word for genealogy is the history or the chronology, the time and the events. So what, what Shem is writing is the, the history and the events in his time and that's what he was passing down. And it's very likely that the three sons went their separate ways after what we just read. They've come out of the ark, they, they've been rebuilding, we know we, we're a couple hundred years down from 
uh, well, 300 by the time Noah dies, it's very likely that the three sons, with their families growing, have begun to move out a little further from each other. And like a lot of families do, they didn't have the telephone to call up and say, Hey, Japheth, I, I hear you, your new great-great-great-granddaddy. Let me get the name down. Let me get the date down. Let me get the pounds down. <laughs> they didn't have those kind of communications. And if the families moved out as they were growing in size and in desire to go into new experiences, then they probably were, you know, they, he just, Shem, the one who was recording what he knew, didn't have everything about all the others. And he did have about his own family because he knew his own family well. They probably would have come together to share at the time of bearing Noah, but it could be again. The others came to visit, and then they took off again. We don't know. We don't know how tight they came. But uh, it does appear that Shem took the responsibility on himself of the passing down of the genealogical family, especially after Babel. Babel's the first 10 verses in chapter 11. Okay. Now, the names of the people in chapter 10 have been found in archaeological discoveries in the past century. So again, archaeology is proving the Bible to be true. With all that in our background, let's start into Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 10. I say that again, remind us it means in the beginning, and we've got the beginning again from Noah, from his three sons. And my tablet doesn't want to go back. Okay, I have tried several times. Let's see if I can get it this way. Yay, chapter 10. Okay, we're going to start off seeing that it's records. You probably have a translation that says, Now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and sons were born to them after the flood. Again, if you have the word generation or anything like that, the Hebrew calls it the history or the chronology. So it's more than just a name. It's passing down that, that history. Verse 2, the sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Medai and Yavan and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus. And I want you all to know that I speak in a foreign tongue. I know foreign language as well. And I'm telling you exactly how they pronounce their names, just like their mamas called them. <laughs> and if you believe that, then you would believe anything I wrote. <laughs> okay, my point being I may not be pronouncing accurately, but we'll, we'll stumble through these names together. What we see about the sons of Japheth is that there are seven here, and they're listed to the third generation. We'll see that in the verses 3 and 4. Um, I'll come to those in just a moment. Now, very likely, Shem started with the eldest brother. It is believed that, if we're understanding scripture right, that Japheth, Japheth was the oldest out of the three sons. So, Shem gave his genealogy first, then moved down to Ham, and then finally gives us his own. So, in the genealogy, the, the records of Japheth, we're going to see he's the father of what became called the Indo-European people. They stretched from India to the shores of Western Europe. Now, it took generations to do that, but you can see if they were starting to spread, why Shem would have lost track after a few generations with the specific details of a name of another child, son in particular, being born. But these people in these areas, from India all the way to the shores of Western Europe, they are linked by linguistic similarities. Linguistic, we're talking language. The language similarities show one who, like a, a layman, is probably invisible to them. I wouldn't be able to, to notice it. But one who is a linguist and understands language and the semantics of, and all of language saw the connection of these people. So they realize this is a family and here was their linguistic um, characteristics. When it mentions Gomer in chapter 3, the sons of Gomer, they are the Celtic family. C-E-L-T-I-C, -E they are the Celtics. Your Germans. Your Romans, the people that were of the Iron Empire, when you look at Daniel's image, when you, you get to the legs and feet of iron, those world empires, the times of the Gentiles, they would have been come from this, from the Germans, from the Romans. The Caucasians, as I mentioned earlier, were to be the largest group, and that's the Gentiles, and they came from Yafet. So 
many of you probably are likely from Japheth or Yafeth from his line. From Gomer, you get the Germanic people who came, um, well, most of the original people of the Western European area, including the original French, the original Spanish, the original Celtic settlers would have come from Gomer. That's the Germanic people. So if you've got Germanic blood in you, this is your history line that we're reading right now. Magog is mentioned, where is Magog mentioned? Verse 2. That would be the ancient Scythians or Scythians, S-C-Y-T-H-I-A-N-S, -S, usually pronounced Scythians. They settled north of the Black Sea, and today this area and these people are known as the Russians. So that's where they came from. When you see Madai in verse 2, M-A-D-A-I, he was a progenitor of the ancient Medes and Persians that we read about um, in Daniel's image also. They populated what's now Iran and Iraq, and some of the people of India were also from Madai. So you have that area of geography being filled in. What you really need to do is take a world map when you're studying chapter 10. If we were in a classroom setting instead of in Zoom and in a room, I would put up a world map and we could look at it, follow it, and if we were a geography class, I especially would do that. But I'm just trying to give you an overall view of where the nations of the world came from. And again, um, this would have been the Silver Empire in Daniel's dream. Next we see the word Yavan or Javan, J-A-V-A-N, and they peopled Greece and Syria. They were the brass in Daniel's image. The ancient Greeks whose seafaring ways are described in verse 5. Look at verse 5. From these the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to the families, into their nations. I'll explain what all that detail means when we hit verse 5, but notice from these the coastlands of the nations. So they lived on the coast and they went into the sea. And I don't mean that they died in the sea. They had ships and they, they sailed on the seas. Ships are not just in our recent time. Ships go all the way back. We even had the ark that floated. It wasn't meant to be a sailing ship. We saw that. It was meant to float. But after that, you've got water they're dealing with. Okay. Tubal are the people of the north and south area of the Black Sea. Again, out of Tubal comes the Russians of today. And Meshach, the name right there, also in verse 2, is also the Russians. So from Magog, from Tubal, and from Meshach, they settled far north of Europe and became what we would call today the Russian peoples. And Tyrus, in verse 2, is a progenitor of the Thracians. Again, they were along the coastlands of the Aegean Sea, and they are the ancestors of the Indo-European peoples that we call that area today. Okay? If it's not clear, again, get yourself a map and spend your time, and you'll see it. Yes? Is that how Meshach's got his name from? Um, I would have to look in at the Hebrew to see if it's the same spelling, but it's it's not. Um, Meshach, when he was given that name, it was a Babylonian name, right. and this is a Russian, so I would oh. imagine they're spelled a little differently. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because it's not in the area of um, Babylon. It's north of that, so north and over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good question though, good question. And there is a name coming up that will be a recognizable name because I went hunting to see is this the same, and it was, but I'll tell you when we get there. Verse 3, the sons of Gomer. Okay, we're still in Japheth's line. This is grandson to Japheth, and the first that, that is mentioned is Ashkenaz. Now, he lived in the vicinity of Armenia, and this is very interesting. They settled north of Judea, in the Fertile Crescent. Fertile Crescent, we know, is where a lot of, of humanity lived in the beginning. But notice they said they settled north of Judea. Now, Jewish literature places them later in Germany. And it's interesting that German Jews today are called Ashkenazi. And here they're descendant of Ashkenaz. And I happen to be one of them because I do have some German Jewish blood in me. So I'm an Ashkenazi. You hear Pastor Gail say he's Sephardic because he has the Spanish-Jewish blood in him. 
came out of the area of Spain. So it's very interesting that the same name that was given in chapter 10 is still relevant and meaning the same thing today. So again, the accuracy of this chapter is amazing. And you've got to remember, this is all the way back. So the records that have been kept, that all the rest of the historians you know, had parts, but didn't have this much. And all everything just proves the Bible and its accuracy. I love it. OK. Gomer also had Rifleth. Uh, again, I don't know if I'm saying it right. There, the inhabitants of Rifleth are Asia Minor. And Togarma are the inhabitants of Asia Minor also. Turkey is Asia Minor for today, to help us understand. Um, so these two, Rif, Rifleth and Togarma, boy, they're um, ancestors of the ancient Armenians that live in the area of Turkey also. Brings us to verse 4. The sons of Javan or Yavan were Elisha and Tarshish, Kitim and Dodanim. Elisha is thought to inhabit Sicily or Cyprus. Tarshish was mentioned in scripture as a flourishing seaport. It could be in Spain, but some believe it's the Tarsus that the Apostle Paul in Asia Minor um, was related to, that he came from Tarsus. He was called Saul of Tarsus, and that was Asia Minor. And we know that Jonah, Jonah also sailed from Tarshish. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3. In my mind, and who am I? I'm no expert, okay? I just, I'm learning at face value here. But in my mind, it fits far more to be Asia Minor because that's the area we're talking about. So I would go to that before I would go to all the way to Spain for this, but it could have been. But in my mind, it's more the Turkey area. Kitim was Cyprus, possibly Macedonia, into Greece. Now you're headed over more toward um, you know, Spain and all that. Dodoni was probably those of the Rhodian or Rhodanium, depending on who's writing it, the Isle of Rhodes. Those islands of the Aegean Seas, these people populated that area. So the record shows that the descendants of Yafet spread all over Europe with one major branch heading eastward into Persia and into India. And I will remind you that Esther, 8th century BC, tells you that the empire that the king ruled over, that she became his queen, Ahasuerus, that his province was, or his kingdom was 127 provinces that reached all the way to India. And that was 8th century BC. That's, that's like the 900 BCs. Did I do that the right way? I think I did. Anyway, you get my point. The sons of Javan, verses 4 and 5, these geographic names spring from the names in that chapter. And again, the linguists that can study the languages of the people see no problem connecting Katim and Cyprus, Rodanum and Rhodes, Gomer and Germany, Meshach and Moscow, Tubal and Tobolsk. So they, they see you know, the peoples of today, the, the linguistic characteristics with those areas to say this was authentic. This was right on target. Verse 5, from these the cosines of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, and into their nations. Now, if you're keeping your wits about you and not getting buried in the detail, you're going to go, uh-oh, 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 wait a minute. How do we get this languages, families, nations, this separation when all three sons, and we're only talking about grandsons at this point, and the people that came from them, I thought they were all one family. What happened? Anybody know what happened? The Babel thing? Very good. Dora gets the A+. Plus. The Tower of Babel. We have that, that when Babel, when God came down and split them up and sent them out, he divides them by their language. Remember, the families moved out by their languages. He confounded language. He didn't confound it within a family. The husband and wife didn't have a problem talking to each other, but they didn't know their neighbor's language anymore, and they didn't know down the street anymore. And so the peoples moved out according to that. So obviously this verse is tipping its hand and letting us know that this was written after the Tower of Babel. 
because Shem's keeping the records. Shem knows and he sees what happened and he lived through the Tower of Babel. He could easily be telling us what happened and we'll see that several times in this chapter. Do we have a uh, year line, timeline as to how many years it took? To spread all out? I'll go look at and try to answer that next week where, where we were. We know we were um, Noah was 300 years after the flood, and we know that by that point they were already spreading. So um, I want to say, if I remember right, the flood was 1656 BC. So by 13, let's just say 1300 BC, we've got great movements, but I don't know how far we come down in time. I'll see what I can find. If I can find um, Tower of Babel, that, the timing on that, I should be able to find, they should have something historically I'm trying to the wheels are trying to turn did I study any dates in there and I don't remember any but good question remind me later to write it down so I don't forget to research okay okay so we're back to um, everyone according to their language their families their nations the divisions of mankind developed language they developed we see genetic um, genetics in the families we see ethnic, which is nations, divisions. Rowena, I think you're asking a question, so unmute yourself. Okay. Or maybe you're helping us with fact. Either way. Yes. Can you help her unmute? She's trying. Rowena? Rowena, yes. But we're almost there. There we go. You're on. Um, I just uh, took note of verse 3. When it says the sons of Gomer were the Ashkenaz, I've been hearing that word Ashkenaz today. The Ashkenaz, is it the same? Yes, yes. I, apparently, because you're babysitting, you missed where I said that. That it is very interesting that Ashkenaz was the, the name of the, let's see, okay, the grandson is Gomer. Gomer has Ashkenaz, so great grandson of Japheth settled north of Judea and in the Fertile Crescent. So the area north of, uh, well, northern Israel, above northern Israel, and over more toward where we know Avram comes from. But Jewish literature does put this family people later in Germany, and German Jews today are still called Ashkenazi. I have German Jewish blood in me. I'm Ashkenazi Jewish. I probably also have the other in me. There's proof of it within my family, so I'm probably a little both. But the main two, and there's more, but the main two are Ashkenazi, which is the same as it was back then. It, it's not that Ashkenaz was Jewish. You don't have your Jewish race yet. You don't have races like that yet. But we see the, the uh, what comes out of his loins will be. Um, We'll come down and we'll see that. The German Jews of today, though, are called Ashkenazi after this name that follows in this line. Um, but again, the, those ethnics, you have to have nations to have the ethnicity so that, like, my ethnicity is Jewish. Somebody else's may be Spanish or Korean or, you know, Italian or Filipina or, you know, whatever. Germ Germanic. We didn't have that when we had the three sons, but we had all the genetic traits. Remember, they were all in there. And as the families moved out, the genetic traits that were stronger in the families, why you see like people that are Japanese are all born looking Japanese. And people that are born in Sweden look like the Swedes. You know, we see the genetics come out in, in the families as we go out, but initially it was all in three sons. Um, <laughs> just in simplicity, in great simplicity. I look at my own family. There were three children. We all three had very different features, even though we had the same parents. That was a small taste of what we see for Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All the gen genetic um, tendencies had to have been in there. And as they became predominant, they came out more and more until you have it continually so that somebody who's born to two Japanese parents doesn't look like me. <laughs> they look Japanese. Okay, but it started out as a, the, a, the name of a son. Yes, started out as a name. Yes, yes. And I think you see that, I want to say without exception, 
Um, remember when we studied Canaan? It started out first, it wasn't the land, it was a person. Then it was his family. Then it was his tribal name. And finally, it became associated with the land that we call Canaan. So yes, again, we're seeing it started with a person. It started with a son. Okay? So I think we're ready for verse 6. Um, and we'll be talking more about the nations, the languages, the families, and all that as we get into the Tower of Babel. Verse 6, the sons of Ham. So now we've done Japheth. We're moving on to Ham. Four sons third generation we're going to see son grandson and great grandson um, the fourth generation being Ham himself so Ham his son his grandson his great grandson is what we see and his descendants populated Africa and the Far East okay we get that by their names the sons of Cush Cush was known for Ethiopia migrated southward into Arabia and then across the Red Sea to Ethiopia Apparently, this family divided into two branches very early. It, it looks like maybe they had a split. We don't know. Some founded Babylon. We're going to see notably that's Nimrod. And others founded Ethiopia. Those are two different areas. Babylon and Ethiopia are not in the same area today. So we see this family went out this way and went out this way. Okay? Mitzrayim is the next name up um, of Sans. <laughs> Ham's sons. <laughs> I'm tongue twisted. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Remember, I think I read you Psalm 78 before. Psalm 105.23 lets us know this. Let me read it to you real quickly just so you can see I can back up what I'm saying or I wouldn't be saying it to you. Okay, Psalm 105 and verse 23. Psalm 105 verse 23 we read, Israel also came into Egypt Thus Jacob, who was Israel, renamed from Jacob, sojourned in the land of Ham. So right here we have when they were in Egypt, they were sojourning in the land that belonged to Ham and his family. So we know Ham and his family settled in Egypt, and Mitzrayim is the one that they associate with the family line in Egypt. Going back to Genesis 10, we see... And we're still in verse 6, I think. Yes. We've done Cush and Mitzrayim. Put or foot, P-H in Old English, P-U in um, mo more modern English. This area was Libya. It was northern Africa and west of Egypt that, that put in his family put their foot down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And then we come to Canaan, Canaan being named. And he settled in the area that's later called, by mistake, but misnamed, misnomer, Palestine. This is the area that would be today Israel and the surrounding regions. When Israel was to go in the land, the Canaanites were one of the first that they were to, to drive out of the land. Remember, because God said he was going to kick them out of their land because of their, evil, their evilness. They were so evil. Verse 7 tells us that the sons of Cush... So now we're to the grandsons of Ham, where Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Raama and Sabtika and the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. We're continuing down. So Seba is today's Sudan. It gave he gave his name to the Sabians. Seba, maybe it was Seba. Sabians, I don't know. Anyway, they are mentioned in Isaiah 45 and verse 14. I will read that for you. Oops. Okay good one now I've lost both my Bibles there we go okay I'm going to to Isaiah 45 Isaiah 45 and we're going to look at verse 14 where we read thus says the Lord the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, will come over to you and you will be yours. They will walk behind you. They will come over you in chains and will bow down to you. They will make supplication to you. Surely God is with you and there is none else, no other God. Okay, very interesting. We're in line of Ham. And once again, what are we seeing? Servant, servile, that they're under. And it's naming them the Sabians, the sons and the grandsons of Cush, except for Nimrod and his descendants, apparently were located in the Arabia and the African areas. 
and again, much slavery is seen in relation in those areas. I said except for because we're going to see what Nimrod builds. If you haven't already picked it up, we'll read about it very shortly. The sons of Rama, the third generation after Ham. You have Ham, you had Cush, you had Rama, and then you're going to have Sheba. Okay, this all they were. Um, the, the sons are Sheba and Dedan. We don't read any further of them probably in that area. Sudan, Africa, Arabia. Then we come to where we get that bit of difference. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. Nimrod we know historically and we know it from scripture. Settled in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, the area of Babylon. Tower of Babel, we're going to see, we're going to understand, okay? Daniel's head of gold later comes from here. His image of the times of the Gentiles. Head Nebuchadnezzar in your English, head of gold, was ruler over Babylon. Nimrod's name means let us rebel. Let us rebel. Let us rebel. Now, could this name have been given to him by Cush? because of his resentment against the curse on Ham's line, maybe seeing that his family line was in servant work, servile work, and he didn't like it, and he wanted to rebel against this curse that was on their line, maybe so. And if so, he put that into his son, not only by name, but he puts it into his son by genetic traits, because his son is going to be very rebellious. The Jewish encyclopedia says of Nimrod that he made all the people rebellious against God. I wouldn't want that said about me. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Let's see what it's telling us just right here in Scripture in order. Um, okay, Cush became the father of Nimrod. Nimrod, he became a mighty one on the earth, or began to be. It gives the idea that there was a struggle for preeminence and that it probably was being obtained by force or by conquest. I'm going to say the Hatfields and the McCoys. I'm going to say your, your skirmishes of wars in, among tribes. Apparently this is what we're seeing, that there was a struggle and he was fighting to be preeminent. Um, he may be trained by his rebellious father, again rebelling against God's purposes for mankind. He might have been determined that his line isn't going to be all serv serv servile, servanthood and so he's going to I'm going to raise us up we're going to be an army we're going to lead an army of rebels and we're going to rebel against being servants he may have struggled for his ascendancy among men and because he didn't want to be a servant but we're going to see really his struggle is against God when it says he became or began to be a mighty one you might have a mighty hunter, we'll come to hunter in a moment, but a mighty one in the Hebrew, when it's written in Hebrew, that can be translated a hero, a chief, or a chieftain. The word, if I, as soon as I give it to you, you say, oh, this is familiar. The word is Gabor. If I say to you, El Gabor, you know I'm talking to you about the mighty God. El is God. So Gabor, apart from El, is meaning mighty. You, you can see maybe the idea of a chief, a head, a lead, a strong one. Okay, when it's used for God, we know it's appropriate, but I get the idea Nimrod was probably trying to indicate that he was a god. You know, he was going to raise himself up like a god and have people follow him and be obedient to him and rule rather than be ruled over. So when we see this phrase in our Hebrew, that he was a mighty one before the Lord, whether it's hunter or not, we'll talk about hunter in just a bit, the idea still from the Hebrew, the connotation, it was not a good one. He did rule over Babel. Babel was the first organized rebellion of humans against God. We have individuals that rebelled. We have it all the way back to Kion, to Cain in the very beginning. But the first of an organized rebellion of humans, Nimrod gets, I'm not going to say the honor, but he gets the rights to be called that, okay? So, Nimrod is a mighty hunter before the Lord. Um, I've got, oh, I missed it, sorry. 
verse 8. 8, okay. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. Okay, mighty hero, a mighty chief, a mighty chieftain, this, this leader, this rebel, on or in the earth. Again, it gives the idea he wanted to be world leader. He wanted to be the conqueror. Who does that remind you of? Satan. Very good. Satan. Satan. What did he want? He wanted that kind of rulership and authority and people worshiping him. I get the same idea that he just, the spirit of Satan was in Nimrod. And we're going to see that if I take you all the way down in a harpy to one that, that we know is coming soon, he's described as the Antichrist. Same spirit. Okay, now, when it said that he was this mighty one on the earth, some say, some sources do say that he was a protector of the people. It's getting real close. I'm, I'm red. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, can I keep talking while you do it? Yeah. I think you all keep hearing me. Okay, when it says that about on the earth being that world leader or that conqueror, some of the sources say that he was a protector of people from wild beasts. That they were wild beasts that were overrunning the land and they received great acclaim from the people for protecting the people from these wild beasts. Okay, let me take you with that in mind. Thank you, Roger, who is not a wild beast, but very helpful. <laughs> let me take you to Shmo, to Exodus 23. Okay, let's go over there for a moment. Exodus 23, and we'll start with verse 27. Exodus 23, verse 27, we read there, and we'll read through verse 30, I think, yes. Okay, 27 to 30, we are reading, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw you into confusion, and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Now I just read to you what should have been the history of the children of Israel. They should have gone into the land, the promised land. They should have wiped out the Canaanites, then gone to wipe out their next enemy and then the next enemy. And if anybody said, well, God, why don't you just wipe out all the enemies at once, just get rid of them all, God just gave the reason. He said if the land became desolate, the wild beasts would roam over the land and they would be a threat to, to the, the people's lives. That... Um, they would they would become too numerous for them. So we cannot say that there wasn't such a thing as wild beasts and wild beasts that could have gotten out of control. But we don't know if that's the right meaning here. And I'll, I'll go back to it and give you a reason for that. Now, Chaldean is very ancient. Ur the Chaldees is the area we're going to see Abram come out of. We go all the way back with Chaldean, Babylonian, history, chapter 11. We're going to be steeped in it with the Tower of Babel. A Chaldean paraphrase says, Cush begot Nimrod, who began to prevail in wickedness, for he slew innocent blood and rebelled against Jehovah. Now there's your other view again. Either he was a mighty hunter taking out these wild beasts and showing the people, I'm protecting you. Look, I killed the lion so the lion couldn't get you. I saw a bear come in and I, well, we can't say shot, but found, you know, he had his way to kill the bear and save the family. He's the hero. He saved the day. It could be like that. But we also have this very prevalent idea of rebellion against God, of leading humans in rebellion against God. It begins to be seen that maybe Nimrod was very wicked and he even slew innocent people in his rebellion against God. And I'll take you back to the days of the posses and the sheriff and, and where the rule of the land was the, the one who had the, the gun, who was the fastest with the gun, was the survivor. And we'll go back further in history to when that we're not talking guns. But we know that it was Lamech in Cain's line, Canaan's line, not Lamech in Seth's line, but the one in Canaan's line that boasted, 
I've murdered people. Cain's got a mark on him so you don't touch him. You want to touch me? It'll be seven times worse. It'll be 70 times worse for you. And he bragged about being a murderer. So all the way back then, you had those who had the capability of taking human life and not feeling remorse or regret. I believe Nimrod had a heart that way, a very rebellious heart against God because of what we see that he does. It doesn't end here. We're going to keep picking it up and we'll see. At the same time, I will not ignore that there were fossil records that indicated tremendous animals that lived at that time that later became extinct. But remember when God said that he put the fear and the dread of man in the beast? That was Genesis 9, verse 2. wasn't that long ago when we were studying it, when Noah came out of the ark and now things were different. Now there was going to be meat for a part of their diet. That was also a way to keep the beasts down in number because they are being slaughtered for food. And we see, um, you know, that there are other animals that did become extinct, but we see that God said he put a fear in them. And we know there is a fear, even in large animals. That, look at a horse. A horse could crush a man in, in a heartbeat. If that man falls out of the saddle and the horse stomps on him or pushes on him with his body, it's good by man. It's not good by horse. And yet, the man can put a little bridle in that horse's mouth and just by tugging at the reins, turn that huge beast to the left or to the right to make that horse go where he wants it to go, not necessarily where the horse wants to go. You got a little donkey that'll stick down his his feet and he'll bray and he'll bulk and he'll fight and he's much smaller but here's a huge horse we know an elephant can crush a man an elephant can be scared of a little mouse <laughs> not saying that people are mice but you get my idea so it's not that that we don't see the word of god accurate no we do again i think the deliberate hunting and the slaughter of even animals would have been against the lord Nimrod may have done that. He may have been one who just slaughtered animals. But I think we're also going to see he may have been building his reputation with what he did toward animals, but it went beyond and went to people also, I think. However he did it, he's going to raise himself up to be like a world leader at his time, at that time. And we're going to see with a name like Let Us Rebel and already the thought that, that he was rebellious toward God, this was not a good thing. Now, again, my sources when I study are very split. You have those that say it was all animals and you have those who say it was all human. And the, this other view is very strong that, that we are not talking about Nimrod's ability to hunt wild game. He was not a hunter of animals, but he was a hunter of men. And that's the idea that I get from the Hebrew context. When we go back to the wording in the Hebrew in Genesis 10, it does seem to indicate more a mighty hunter of men than it does of animals. We don't see that mention of animals. I have to get back to where we were. I went too far in chapter 10. Here we go. He became... Um, a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, I'll show you hunting in scripture shortly, and you'll see why it could go to animal life. But the idea here, again, that he was a hunter of men. He was after men. He was a warrior. He could kill. He could fight. He could be ruthless. And his kingdom in the Euphrates area he made it like a, in the valley, he made a city-state. He consolidated. So it would be like the sheriff taking over the town, the mayor becoming the authority in the town, and the town has to do what the, this one says because he was so strong and so powerful. In that line, there's a, um, a man by the name of Ginsburg. He quoted from a Jewish legend. Notice they say legend, okay? But... It still gives us an idea and the thought of men at that time. The great success that attended all of Nimrod's undertakings produced this sinister effect. Men no longer trusted in God, but trusted in their own prowess and their own ability, an attitude to which Nimrod tried to convert the whole world. Remember that Chaldean paraphrase that, that he got the whole world to rebel against God. 
So this Jewish legend, which we call a legend because it wasn't in the scriptures being the authoritative word of God, but it yields itself to that also. That we have Nimrod trying to get the whole world of people to be rebellious against God and he be their leader. Another source says, hence it's likely that Nimrod, having acquired power, used it in tyranny and oppression. How many times do you see that? You give somebody a little bit of power, it goes right to their head, and all of a sudden they want to be tyrannical, they want to oppress, they want to control, they want to, to, to just be this dictator. And Nimrod's described as one that with violence and rapine, which is violent action, that he founded the domination which first distinguished by name a kingdom in the face of the earth. And what it was, was that he basically was saying, this is Nimrod's earth. And this, this um, when it was writing about it, said, God deliver the world. So Nimrod's setting himself up to be a mini-god, and to be over the earth. And it fits in my mind when we see that's what Satan has always wanted and done. And if he's got a rebellious heart toward God, he's going to be filled with the spirit that we see in Satan, and this fits. And mighty hunter can be translated tyrant from the Hebrew. Okay, and it is suggesting ruthless, brutal methods. It has an evil connotation to it, even when it's used in hunting. Let me show you. I'll take you to 1 Samuel. It's using the same Hebrew word, okay? So we're getting this mighty hunter in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24. 1 Samuel 24. We're going to go to verses 9 through 11. We're going to read verse 11 in the King James Version because it makes it a little more clear um, than in some of our translations that give us good understanding. But the King James used the language of that day. And if I can call it up, I just lost it. There it is. Whoops. Okay, that's close enough. I think it'll get it. 1 Samuel 24, verses 9 through 11. We have here... David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men, saying, Behold, David seeks to harm you? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you to today into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Okay, and if you read that in verse 11, oh, I haven't read 11 yet, have I? Sorry. Now my father see, indeed see the edge of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. Know and perceive that there is no evil or rebellion in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. Now let me read verse 11 in the King James. Moreover, my father see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. I have not sinned against you, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. That's that same Hebrew root. And the idea, if you don't understand this, what's happening? David was hiding from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. Saul was so jealous of him, he wanted to kill him. David was far back in the cave. Sorry. Yes, yes. Saul came in to the same cave. Long story short, when David had a chance to take Saul's life and his men were egg, egg, egging him on to do it, he said, no, God put Saul in the position of king and I won't touch the, the, the anointed by God. But he cut off part of his robe. He let him know I was so close. I got part of your robe. I could have killed you. I didn't do it even though you're hunting me down like an animal. So here's your connotation. Nimrod hunting men like animals. You hunted my soul to take it. You hunted me like an animal. Let me give you another example. Job. You owe chapter uh, 10 and verse 16. Job chapter 10 and verse 16. Where we read there in Job 10 and verse 16, Should my head be lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion. And again, you would show your power against me. So hunting a person like an animal. I can give you many more references. I'll give you one more, and then I'll give you some to look up on your own. 
Uh, if you have the cross-references, you have these. Right now I'll take you to Psalm because it's close by. Psalm 140 and we'll look at verse 11. Psalm 140 and verse 11, we read there. May a slander not be established in the earth. May evil hunt the violent man speedily. Hunt him down like an animal. Um, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26. Micah, Micha chapter 7 and verse 2. Again, if you have the um, King James Version, you'll see it in Ezekiel 13, 18, where it says hunt. In the New American that many of you have, it uses the word capture. We capture animals. Same idea. So hunting, seeking men's souls, that's an antithesis against God. God is seeking the soul of man for his own. He wants your soul. Not to hunt you down. Not to do you evil. Not wicked ways. God wants to to seek your soul to hunt for you that you might find him and come into his protection into his safety he being your god but here the idea very much is what i see in the name for nimrod that he's rebelling against god he's throwing it in the face of god god you're going to hunt them to save their souls i want to hunt them to kill their souls one more for me and he's got another notch in his belt because he's taken out another life that's the idea that I see in the side that I fall on, but you're free to make up your own mind back in Genesis 10. And I just went off. I can hear it's gone again. So I'll just try to stay loud because I'm trying to get to an ending point for our what class. Is it says it's green, but it's gone. Check your mouth. How do I check it? What do I do? It's gone. I can That's hear it's good. gone. Everything down here says good. And everything here says good. But there's something not good. <laughs> it's Nimrod. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Speaker. It's our speaker. He's trying to rewire his speaker real quickly. Okay, so we've really talked about that mighty hunter suggesting he was a tyrant. He went after people like you to hunt down an animal. He was wanting it against God, not for God. And that's why it says here back in Genesis 10 and uh, verse 9, and I'm going back to it myself, that he was a uh, mighty hunter before the Lord, or a better translation from the Hebrew than would be in the face of the Lord, in defiance of the Lord. We'd say today against the Lord, that uh, he is, is hunting down souls to capture them and take them away from the Lord. In that view, from the Hebrew, our Jerusalem Targum, which is rabbinic um, commentary on the, the scriptures, it says about Nimrod, he was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. For he was a hunter of the sons of man, and he said to them, Depart from the judgment of the Lord, adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore it was said, as Nimrod the strong one, strong in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. And I think here you have the character of Nimrod. And it says, therefore it is said. He made a name for himself. We're talking about him centuries later, thousands of years later. He got part of what he wanted. He wanted to be known. He wanted to be known as a great, mighty ruler, leader, rebeller against God. Well, we're going to look at the defeat. We're going to see God has the final word. But I think that the, there's far more evidence of it being that way. He could have also, like I said, he could have proven power over the animals and then took it to men. He could have done it simultaneously. It could be it didn't have anything to do with the animals, but I definitely see his rebellion against God in what follows as we continue to study. And we will see... Um, let me just give you fast, and then I'll repeat it next week when we start again, verse 10, because I think that will tie the thought to Nan where I can stop. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq and Akkad and Kama in the land of Shinar. Or Shinar. Babel, the original meaning, means the gate of God. Now, how do we get that? Because we know that today we say Babel means confusion. And the reason is we've got to go back into the original languages, back into this time, pre-Hebrew, into Akkadian, into Babylonian, into um, some of these ancient languages. And we find that Nimrod founded a city. He named it Babalu. 
and I'm not talking, for those of you who remember I Love Lucy, I'm not talking <laughs> Ricky's Baba Lou, but it would be spelled B-A-B-I-L-U. It wasn't originally Babel. That was the Hebrew translation that came down. And Babalu, in that ancient language um, that morphs into what we see in our Hebrew, meant gate of God. Babel is what it's called by the time we get it recorded. Moshe, Moses, being a Hebrew, wrote Genesis, we believe, or compiled the books of Genesis, and calls it Babel because in the Hebrew it was called Babel. The same way that, that you know, I'll call it Yerushalayim, you call it Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the English, I'm saying it in the Hebrew. So Moshe gave the name in Hebrew, Babel, and that does mean confusion, but in the ancient language, what Nimrod named it, he didn't name his, his empire, if I can call it that. He didn't name it confusion. He named it gate of God. Stay tuned next week to find out why he called it gate of God. Because I'm going to make you come back to get that. I will give you a hint that he wanted to be worshipped. But notice again how God has the final word. What's it known of as today? What's the meaning today? What's carried down through the generations? How do we use that expression? How do we use that word today? We're going to pick all of that up when we start again next week. So I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. What was Babel really like? And should it be called Babelu? And why was it called Babelu? Or should it be called Babel? And why does Moshe bring it down as Babel? And I could say so much more. And oh, by the way, should I make you do your homework? Those of you who have good sources to go looking, see if you can find out the size of Babel. Compare it to something that we're familiar with today. And if you can't, I'll tell you myself next week. I will give you a city that you're familiar with, and I will tell you how it compares in size to this original Babel. I think it'll be an eye-opener. Did I make you all want to come back? Are you on the edge of your seats? It gets better, folks. Just wait till we see the intervention of God and what goes on. Wow. Are you talking about sizes in population or size as in square? I, I meant geographically, and I don't mean specifically. I don't mean down to like X number of miles, but it's compared in, if you look in, in literature and studying Babel, it's compared to... Um, Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you the city. You see if you can find it, if you can find it one of your sources. Compare it to London. We know well what London is like today. Compare it to London. Was Babel smaller then? Was Babel larger then? And if so, about how many times smaller or larger? Okay, that makes it a little easier. And if you find something else to compare it to, bring it to us because different views help us understand. But... Uh, I just want us to get out of our tiny minds because, at least me, I'm, I'm guilty of that. I see everything on a small scale. I don't understand the, the number of slain under the throne in heaven is so large. It's called myriads. It can't be numbered. I can't fathom that many people under the throne of God in heaven. Heaven's huge. Heaven's noisy. Heaven has so much going on. It's, it's big. And it's like, you know, when I try to help us relate and see that Noah lived all the way down almost to Abraham's time, we see the overlapping how a, a grandfather could be teaching his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, the lessons they learned spiritually. I want us to see the connection. I want us to see they were real people, that they lived like you and I. They got up in the morning, and guess what? They were hungry, and they ate breakfast. They worked. They went to bed at night. They weren't different than you and I. So we can learn from their mistakes. We can learn from what they do right. And I just want us to see a bigger picture because I see these few people. Well, remember we got to 7 billion by the time the flood came? And we're at 7 billion today plus. So we can... we. Do you really think of that in Noah's day, that there were this many people on the earth? I didn't, so I'm forced to think it. You know, this is what I want us to do. Babel wasn't... I started to give you the answer. <laughs> Fill in the blank. I'm going to close in prayer. We can discuss if you want. Lord, thank you. Thank you for showing us 
mankind in a way that we can relate, that we can see that you still use us when we make mistakes, and that that isn't how you um, describe us as only that mistake. But you take one like Noah, and you show us he was righteous in your eyes, that through, through his belief, his faith, he could attain that, that standard by you. Not that he lived it, but that you saw him in that way, the same as you do us today, that when we make our mistakes, you are not done with us. You have graciousness to forgive. Lord, we want to stay in line. We want to crucify ourselves, and we don't want to be taken out to the woodshed. We want to be obedient and not a rebeller like Nimrod. But let us learn from these people. Let us learn the lessons that you, the same God, yesterday, today, and forever, are dealing in man's life in a phenomenal way. And we should just humbly serve you, worship you, praise you, and thank you that you even find any value in one like me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it leads us, that, that there's nothing new under the sun. Whatever we are facing today and we need help, the answer's in your word. And thank you for giving us such a love letter for us to read over and over and over. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you, get into the love letter, read it this week, read it again and again and again. So much to learn. If you put yourself into a war scene and you may be in a battle and you get a note from your loved one from home, that's gold in the midst of that battle. And you're going to climb in, in your um, trench, what do they call it? You know, the... the Fossil, thank you. And you're going to pull out that letter and you're going to read it till you've got it memorized. Well, memorize the Word of God. That's His love letter. And then when you're in that trench and you've got the fire going on around you and they're shooting at you and you think you're going to go under, the Lord's going to say, Remember my words of love. Remember how I brought Daniel through. Remember how they went into the fire and one was walking with them that wasn't thrown in there. And what was singed? Not a hair. Just the ropes that bound them so that they weren't even bound. You think that you're going to die in this foxhole? I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to take you out of the fires. I'm not going to let the waters go over you. You won't drown. I'm going to float you like I floated Noah and took him safely through. And I could go on and on and on. So let it be a faith builder. Have a great week with the Lord. Study and see what you find out. Come back and we will talk about a very pivotal pivotal scene of human history. Wow. Very interesting. And I'm not babbling. At least I trust I'm not. <laughs> okay. Mics off me. Open the mics. You all babble. <laughs>